But I also know from uh, firsthand experience how they will quietly come up to you and uh, applaud you for the direction you're taking and um, and the you know going through the actual rulemaking process and doing things properly. But they will not tell you you know they will not say that publicly because they don't want to get castigated by the you know the political left who has continued to stir these issues up unceasingly. Welcome to the Acton Line podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. Betsy DeVos joins Eric Cohn in studio to discuss her new book, Hostages No More. In her book, DeVos writes about her experiences working in the Trump administration and how the woke curriculum is negatively impacting our children's learning. She also lays out a detailed approach to fixing America's badly broken education system and securing a prosperous future for our kids. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Betsy DeVos, welcome to Act in Line. Thanks so much. It's great to be with you, Eric. So you have a new book out, uh, Hostages No More, The Fight for Education Freedom and the Future of the American Child. What's your book about? Indeed. The book is about what we need to do to fix American education. And it's uh, based on my 35 years of experience fighting for education freedom, school choice for families. And uh, and it's a lot of great stories about places that are doing it well and differently for kids. And it's also about how what we do from here to ensure that all families are empowered to make the right decision and the right fit for their child. How did you get so involved in uh change in education, in the education system, uh, passionate about the subject matter and also about addressing the glaring problems that exist within the system right now? Well, it started when I was looking at schools around the Grand Rapids area for our oldest child, who's now 40, and we were looking for kindergartens for him. And uh, I visited a number of schools and in the process of doing so found a great little urban Christian school in the heart of Grand Rapids, serving the community, the neighborhoods around the the school, and realized very quickly that for every child that was there and every family represented, there were probably 10 or 20 other families that wanted that same kind of opportunity for their child or children and couldn't because it cost, you know, it cost money to send them there, the tuition. And so I started uh, in an advocacy role and uh, tried to convince people to change policy um, by persuasion. And it very soon became clear that it really needed to be um, uh, that politics were heavily involved and we needed to use political force and action to be able to change policy, too. So it's been a, a, prog- a progression. But um, but very early, I realized that um, my husband and I, Dick and I, were going to be able to do what we wanted in terms of our children's education because we had the resources. But it's fundamentally unfair that every family doesn't have that opportunity, that same opportunity. And we spend billions of dollars every year on education. And so it's not a matter of resource. It's, it's a matter of who controls those resources and where they get to direct them. Yeah, I, we were talking before we started this interview that I had uh, moved here to Grand Rapids from Chicago. And Chicago always drove the problem of uh, particularly public education, but education in general, because you have the intersection with the private and the parochial education system there home to me that you you look around at the students in that system and you see so many how how much their futures are affected by really two things their household income and their zip code whether they're living in an area of the city where they have a good school as their community public school and whether if they don't they have the money to be able to escape in your experience um, cuz again in talking about education this is a passionate issue for me in Chicago 
I've been told I was wrong about public education in Chicago for all kinds of reasons. But the one I never got was no one ever said to me, Cone, man, you're just wrong. CPS, Chicago Public Schools, that's a system that's educating kids. People knew that it wasn't working. And yet the resistance to system change, uh, whether it be vouchers, opportunity scholarships, um, allowing the, the money to follow the student rather than going to specific schools, is resisted so heavily. Why do you think that resistance exists? Well, the resistance is there because there's a very, very strong built-in bureaucracy and status quo protection device uh, headed by the teachers' unions. And then, uh, you know, there's all kinds of allied organizations that all have, uh, you know, they're they're protecting what they know, what they have, what they have power and control over. And it's all about adult issues. It's not about what's right for individual children. And all we need to do— is switch that paradigm to, instead of sending resources to buildings and systems, send them to families to control what, how and where their ch- children get educated. If we do that, I mean, it's a fundamental change, but if we do that, we're going to see creativity in what kinds of K-12 experiences can, kids can have in just a very short matter of time. Not only that, but we're going to see achievement levels rise as a result. You know, we know uh, this last two years has really laid bare for families across the country the failings of the system that many for years have thought was doing just fine. Well, that's been laid bare through the experiences of COVID. And many other questions have been raised during that time, whether it's around curriculums or how, you know, high expectations are are being um, laid upon kids in, in a, a variety of situations. But the, the, the all of these problems have come into focus in a way like they've never before. And so the time is right now for policy change for parents to be empowered with those decisions. And uh, I I like to use the metaphor of a backpack. You know, most kids go to school every day with the things they need for the day in the backpack. Metaphorically speaking, we should attach the money that's already being spent on that child. And on average, nationwide, we spend $15,000 a year per child for their education, more in many urban areas, less in other areas, but on average, $15,000. If families had those resources to be able to direct into a appropriate setting for each of their children or to customize, frankly, customize their education, we would see dramatically different results. That, that last point is an interesting one, the customization of it. That there are, in the year 2022, you think with the advent of the internet, you know, some of the things that also were frustrating to parents about uh, the COVID education experience, classes over Zoom and all of that. Um, I also think about a project I worked on when I was in Chicago. We were trying to bring a virtual charter school to the Fox River Valley area. And I'm sure it will surprise you none, the resistance that came from school boards. We had to apply to all the school boards that this area would cover. Um, And the loss of revenue was, of course, the first thing that they're focused on. But we tried to stress the point that this isn't a product for everyone. If you've got a kid who plays travel baseball, he's really, really good. Like, you know, he's the kind of, you know, young high schooler who is on a track to get drafted and probably go to Major League Baseball someday. This is the kind of program for him because it allows him to keep up on his studies, uh, even with all of that travel schedule and being away from a brick and mortar building. And yet that built in resistance is so incredibly strong. And there just seems to be a reticence to think more creatively and imaginatively about different ways that we can educate children rather than the, uh, and while public education works fine for some kids, the, the idea that one solution is the best solution for everybody is not something we accept in almost any other area of life. And yet here we are still having that conversation about public education in those parameters. Exactly right. And I've often said education is the least disrupted industry in our country. And some people will push back and say, well, education's not an industry. It's unique. It's special. It is. It's very unique and it should be very special, but it is an industry. Mm-hmm. 
We spend $750 billion alone on K-12 education in this country. At the federal level, since the Department of Education was formed in 1979, we have spent over $1 trillion at the federal level alone with the express purpose of closing the achievement gaps. Not only has that achievement gap not narrowed one little bit, in most measures it's actually widened. And those, and, and most distressingly, not, well, equally distressingly, uh, the most recent data is showing, and this is before COVID, that those at the top end of the spectrum, the highest performers, have plateaued out, and those at the bottom have plummeted. And so why are we talking about more and more resources into the same approach and the same system and then expect different res- results? As Einstein often said, it is the definition of insanity. And uh, and this is with our most valuable uh, part of our future, our children, the rising generation. Um, this, is, uh, this is something that we have to get serious about fundamentally repositioning and uh, shifting the whole approach to it. When we do, we're going to see results that we haven't even dreamt of. I want to dig in for a moment on COVID and you know, we, it was an awful period of time, and I think we should recognize that. But I, I don't think there's anything wrong in looking for what the silver linings were of that period of time we experienced. And to me, one of the biggest was how it, it was revelatory about a number of things in American society, uh, some of them good and some of them bad. Uh, but f- I think one of the foremost ones that sticks out to me is what it revealed about education when all of a sudden in uh, March and April of 2020, kids are at home, they're doing classes over Zoom. I I keep having that definition, the Irving Kristol definition of neoconservatism stuck in the back of my head. It's a, a liberal who's mugged by reality. I think a lot of parents were mugged by reality when they started experiencing that. One, um, the, the, challenge of juggling their professional lives, working from home or not working from home in a lot of cases as well, and their kids' education. And then also the revelations that they had about the curriculum. And this doesn't have to be necessarily about some of the more incendiary stuff or some of the more controversial stuff that we've heard. But it was revelatory of, I don't really think that this curriculum is adequate. And unsurprisingly then, parents carrying caring more about their children than anybody else ever will. I think it was was it Phil Graham who was uh, once asked about, um, you know, told by a woman, uh, you know, the problem, I start from my point of view on education is I care more about my children than anyone else does. And she responds, no, I care about your children just as much as you do. It's like, all right, what are their names? Right? <laughs> you know you're going to care more about your kids than anyone else. Absolutely. And they're looking at this situation and seeing that I just don't think this is adequate anymore. And they start to get involved and they run headfirst into that same bureaucratic system you were talking about before. And I can only imagine how uh, how quickly many of them were mugged by that reality and realizing there's a whole lot more and it's more complex going on here than I ever realized. Absolutely. And and you mentioned incendiary curriculum, uh, but I think, and that has been a huge factor for involvement of parents like never before. But um, equally so, I think parents have seen a lack of robustness and expectation in what their children have been uh, receiving. And, um, and, and, you know, even before COVID, we saw the uh, dismal results on average of American students vis-a-vis the rest of the world. So as compared to counterparts in the rest of the world, we are 37th in math, 13th in reading, and 18th in science. Now, if we were competing at those levels in the, the Olympics, let's say, would anybody in our country be satisfied with that? I think there would be a huge outcry. We need to have that same outcry about how our kids are able to achieve educationally. And we need to acknowledge that all of this was a factor and this was uh, many kids' realities well before COVID hit. But I think you're right. The silver lining is that uh, families across the country and grandparents and neighbors have awakened to the failings of a system that's 175 years old. 
I mean, the industrial model of education was founded 175 years ago, and we have not substantively changed our approach to how we have kids experience their K-12 years of learning. And yet we know every child is individual and unique, and there are many ways that kids can learn we need to facilitate ways for that to happen. Even small things too, right? So I, whenever I talk to other working parents, um, you know, we, we're talking today on June 13th, right? So my kid's last day of school was on Friday. Uh, so they're now on summer break. They go off of school for three months. And, you know, there's historical reasons why the school calendar is the way that it is. But that's an enormous challenge for a lot of parents out there to figure out what they're doing with their kids for three months of a period of time. And there are alternative— Not to mention, and not to mention the learning loss that exactly. occurs over that space of time. Exactly. There are— Alternative models that exist out there, you know, the um, there's year-round schooling models that have kids take uh, periodic two-week breaks rather than having three months off at a period of time. And yet again, it's like these things seem – they present to me as obvious. And the resistance that exists to even small changes like that – and again, this is where I draw so much from my experience in Chicago – how much of it is collectively bargained, that it's you, it is hard to innovate in systems that are that set in stone, where you have to go through that much of a bureaucratic process. And again, the, one of the, some of the worst kind of them in that you have politicians and union heads all sitting down and negotiating over other people's money and other, and other people's, people's children. children. Yes, yes, absolutely right. Well, a monopoly, we know monopolies don't work. And uh, this is the largest monopoly we have anywhere in our country, uh, because unless you have the resources, you are part of the system. And there are areas, there are, there are bright spots, places like Florida that have uh, continued to innovate and continued to provide families with more options. Still plenty of demand there and a long way to go, but they are definitely the furthest down the track in terms of freeing families to make the right choice and, and uh, decide the right place for their children. But when we win, and I say it's a matter of when, not if, because the support for this notion of education freedom and the funds following and supporting individual children is supported by three out of four individuals in this country, no matter how you cut it, but no matter what the demographics. And so this is a matter of when we have education freedom. Um, I think we are going to see the greatest round of creativity around experiences that kids will have that we could we, we can't even begin to imagine how how many different kinds of approaches and solutions and customizations there will be for children to get their K-12 learning. So I want to I want to zoom out for a moment here um, because I want to get to what solutions look like, you know, what what are the ways that we should be trying to uh, innovate and change within this education system. Um, I, I hate monocausal explanations of anything. Everything in this world is more complex than that. Um, as, as you look at and from your experience as Secretary of Education, and I want to ask some specific questions about that in a moment, um, from your experience as an advocate, as a Secretary of Education, what are the handful of biggest challenges, biggest roadblocks that exist out there to education reform? Well, the biggest roadblock is the, are the national teachers unions and then all of their allies and uh, all of the cascading organizations that are part of the traditional government-run public school system. And uh, they have greater or lesser power in, uh, in each state, depending on the culture and the construct of each state. But they are, by and large, the reason we cannot, we have not to date, been able to empower families in the way that there's been uh, a desire to do. Um, that, again, we talked about the fact that 
people have awakened to uh, the power of this monopolistic government-run approach and are ready for uh, parents to, to have their voice and to be able to make these decisions. And so the policies that will uh, ha- have followed already this past year in a number of states and will continue to be um, expanded and implemented depending on the state are really, really important for individual children. Um, but I, I feel like this is a dam that's about to break, and when it does, uh, it will be the best thing for children. But there, but it has been a huge, a huge logjam, um, because the real, reality is, you know, taxpayers fund, uh, fund the ultimately fund the dues for the unions that then go around into supporting elected officials based on their support for the union and the status quo's agenda. And it's been a vicious cycle. So politicians are equally to blame for the the lack of creativity and the lack of resolution around kids and around kids' futures. They have been standing with uh, the system and with the status quo and with adults. That is changing now as well. And it has also historically been a bipartisan problem as well. I mean, from my own Illinois experience, um, some of the most uh, optimistic we ever were about uh, school reform legislation. It's probably 10 years ago now. Um, but a major part of killing that legislation were Republicans who were also receiving money from the teachers unions. Um, it is a it is the worst kind of problem in that sense that it is, you know, we have a lot of partisan problems to deal with in this country right now. But, you know, a bipartisan, enormous problem like that it makes it very hard to break through when you know, there isn't uh, a clear constituency rep- being represented by political leaders trying to force this change uh, through. Well, and uh, we've seen it often on uh, the Republican side of the equation with individuals who represent more rural districts thinking that our schools are really pretty good here mm-hmm. and I don't want to, you know, rock any boats. But again, I think COVID and everything that flew out of flowed out of covid has uh, has revealed the deficiencies and has also uh, given elected officials more insight into what can be different and what should be able to be should be able to be empowered for families. And I, in, in talking with rural legislators, I often um, talk about the different kinds of choices that that they can make. I think everybody tries to envision a competing building being uh, erected next to a rural uh, school. That doesn't have to be the solution. The solution can be uh, buying virtual classes for classes that that school can't possibly uh, hire a teacher for or have the demand in students for. Or perhaps, as many families discovered over the course of COVID, there's a a consortium of, of families uh, with children who learn a different way that have uh, have formed their own little mini school together. Well, there's no reason that that little mini school couldn't continue and exist in, a, in an exist in an existing infrastructure in a school building, uh, renting or leasing part of the space. You just have to think more broadly and creatively about what education freedom can actually look like and what it could be for every child that would be able to access it. You have that problem you identified there with uh, rural communities. And then I also think of the, you know, again, I keep coming back to my Chicago and Illinois examples. It's the one I'm most familiar with. Um, In Chicago's North Shore, uh, you have public schools that, if we're being honest, operate almost like they're private schools because you have a lot of wealth in those communities. You have a lot of people who aren't uh, – don't have a problem with saying I'm all right with paying uh, higher tax levies, particularly in property taxes, in order to fund these schools as if I were paying you know, a $30,000 tuition to a private uh, K-12 school, which you, you can find those uh, – enormously expensive K-12 schools in the city of Chicago. But it, in that sense, it come, seems to come at the expense of like the people that I think, well, I agree with everybody I think would benefit from having more choice in their uh, in the education world. 
inner city schools are the places where it's just most obvious to me that kids and families would benefit from having those choices. But because there's a comfortability at the rural level, there's a comfortability at the suburban level, and despite you know this clear constituency that exists in major cities, and it's not just Chicago, it's Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, um, that would benefit from those kind of choices because other areas are comfortable that whole area just just kind of gets forgotten. And, and to some extent, again, this is where Illinois is unique. I grew up downstate, just kind of written off. Like, you know, we don't, downstaters don't like to think about Chicago. You know, Chicago is a problem. And when we're thinking about it, we're not happy about it. Uh, but it's it, the biggest issue of concern for quality of education in Illinois to me has always been inner city Chicago. And it just kind of gets forgotten it, with everybody else seems comfortable within the I think malformed, but nonetheless functioning well enough for them version of education. Well, I think that that has been true. But I I do think the last two years have revealed to a lot of those folks in rural and suburban areas that their schools haven't been perfect either. And uh, and a lot of families have been really disappointed by, uh, especially by how schools operated or frankly didn't uh, were very deficient in uh, coming stepping up to actually have you know solve problems and have students continue their learning. I mean, we won't know the long term impact of learning loss on all kids in this country for probably several years yet due to the all of the covid shutdowns and the back and forth with in person out of person the you know the hybrid schedule however you cut it kids got hurt and the most vulnerable among them are the ones that have gotten hurt the most but i think also suburban and uh, rural families have have had a uh, front row seat into their child's experiences. And many parents, many families are not happy with what they've seen and would like to have something different for their children. Or out of necessity during COVID, uh, you know, formed something up on their own that's working quite well, frankly, and they'd like to continue that. So, they will they will demand different and they will ultimately demand to have the support to be able to do this with their children and that's why i think uh we're going to see the kinds of policy changes that we haven't been able to see implemented before there's there's the drive and the demand for it today that there hasn't been before and i think that's that's due to the uh you know the experiences of the last 2 years so for about four years, you were the Secretary of Education uh, after a you know, whole career advocating for education reform. Here you are sitting at the head of the agency that is most responsible for education in this country. What was the most surprising thing to you? You know, you, you could be so informed on these kinds of systems, and I, I can only imagine, because obviously I haven't been there, then you find yourself in this role, right? What surprised you the most about assuming that office and uh, the day-to-day, but the big picture problems as well? So I knew that a large federal agency was going to be very bureaucratic and cumbersome. I did not fully appreciate how bureaucratic it was or is, um, and and they are generally, uh, the ability to get the simplest of things done and accomplished is almost impossible in a federal agency. Um, On the one hand, that's a good thing because it precludes some bad things from happening. But on the other hand, uh, this department is generally philosophically non-aligned and is uh, is dead set on uh, thwarting any kind of move toward devolving and respecting the role of states and local communities. They like to have the power in Washington. And, um, you know, I often said while in office, I would be happy to work myself out of a job. I don't believe the Federal Department of Education ultimately has a role to play. There are a couple of functions within the department that have uh, that have to happen and have to have uh, an outlet, but there are other agencies that can handle it. There are way too many. Uh, there is way too much ability from the federal level to uh, control and regulate 
uh, what happens in states and communities. And I think that's been to the detriment of public education across the country. Um, so that was at the, at the core most surprising was just just how difficult it is uh, and how broken it is. And uh, and at the same time, upon reflection, not surprising. Is this a structural problem within our government that we should, I think, spend time more th- thinking more about that, you know, I, I agree with your point that uh, in a way we want bulwarks against instantaneous radical reform, right? One needs only to study the founding of this country and the kinds of systems of checks and balances of slow change over time uh, to understand that that was the founding father's intention. It shouldn't be easy to radically change things because you can, you know, make one radical change, you may get uh, a lot of things that you want, and there'll be a lot of unintended consequences. And as a result, evolving into changes is probably advisable. However, in a department like that, where you have people whose career is working in a department like that, well, if you've got a 30-year career and you're looking at someone who wants to change the orientation of a department like that, the way that it serves the American citizenry, you think, oh, you know, you sit on your hands for four years and you just wait that person out. I mean, that strikes me as a huge problem in the functioning of our governmental system that we're uh, maybe a little more attuned to right now, but nonetheless probably didn't think a whole heck of a lot about. Well, you're absolutely right. And that is exactly what uh, what many of these activists do within a department like the Department of Education. Um, and, and just to roll back a little bit, I, I mentioned that the department was founded in 1979. It was a payoff to Jim, to the teachers unions after Jimmy Carter promised the formation of the department to get their endorsement during his presidential uh, bid. And um, and so it, this is, you know, the the workings of the status quo um, topped and headed by the teachers union and their agenda has been a progressive movement over the last 60 years to infiltrate more deeply into all the all of the state and local systems. And that was uh, that was an intentional move over time. And we're seeing the fruit of that or the results of that in many ways today. Uh, but when when um, when talking about radical change, uh, you you do have uh, the ability with bureaucrats to come in. Well, we've seen with the administration that preceded the one I served uh, a rule by letter, the dear colleague letters that were levied out of the department and have zero um, zero basis in the law. They're simply letters that a bureaucrat. And uh, a, a political bureaucrat wrote, and um, and then they would they use the forces of the department to bully uh, schools and states into doing things that they wanted around their agenda, and we're seeing that happen again. Uh, I was very intent on respecting the role of the states in education and in only follow, in following the letter of the law and not making law, but that's not that's not what these bureaucracies generally tend to do. They do tend to want to uh, rule by the bureaucracy, and uh, it is an overcreep of the administrative state for sure. You mentioned those dear colleague letters. I want to do a quick sidebar here to bring up one of them. We've been talking primarily about K-12 education. Um, We have been also uh, in conversations in this country in uh, uh, last number of months, especially as we've been talking about student loan debt for higher education, been more focused on higher education. I think we probably all agree there are a whole lot of problems that exist in the higher education system. Um, but w- one of them that always baffled me was the dear the Title IX Dear Colleague letter from the Obama administration um, that just seemed to me I'll admit my own, you know, my own philosophical views on these things to just never have made sense. Um, we're asking universities, we're asking an institution to get very Yuval Levin for a moment here. We're asking an institution that exists for a very specific purpose, for the uh, a higher level exploration of philosophy and ideas to all of a sudden become a police force 
and a judge and a jury. And for people who don't know what that Dear Colleague letter was, this is what empowered universities to deal more directly with incidents of sexual assault, with incidents of rape, in adjudicating them on their own campuses rather than handing them off to police departments and to the judicial system, the courts, in order to handle them. And the loss of due process that happened in the issuance of that letter, that people would be, and uh, as we could clearly see also from the resulting lawsuits, most of which are won by the people who bring them who have been on the other side of accusations where they can't confront their accuser, they can't be represented by counsel, they can't submit evidence. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, these, you don't even have to think that there's something malicious going on. There can be misunderstandings that often happen amongst young people be very clear there are incidents that should have been handled by police and courts but a lot of these are complicated and we're asking educate university education bureaucrats to adjudicate issues of sexual assault and rape and it just it seemed to me on its face to never make sense and yet the outrage at the rescinding of that letter um, I don't like continuing to be surprised by these things, and yet I found myself surprised. Um, would, I imagine you were expecting that kind of a reaction because of how political it had become. But again, would you know? I keep asking, were you surprised by these things? Were you surprised by that reaction? I wasn't surprised by the reaction of rescinding the letter, uh, and 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 frankly, the whole process I knew was going to be very very difficult, but it was a necessary. Uh, process to undertake to actually do rulemaking around uh, how these ma matters are to be handled on campuses. And you're right; so many of these things are really not uh, they they should not be in the uh, in, in the purview of an institution, a higher ed institution. And there are ways for them to actually, under our rule, um, you know, work with other institutions. That there there's there's now a framework and a process that is very clear. It is very fair. It respects uh, both parties in a situation in their rights and um, it provides a very clear pathway and empowers, frankly, importantly, empowers the individual who was wronged to really decide how they want to proceed with it, which previously under this dear colleague scenario were often that that was often taken away from them completely and many individuals found themselves in these whole long uh, investigations and uh, discussions and the, you know their their lives essentially destroyed without having any say in that matter um, we also were very careful about the notion of actually defining what sexual uh, assault is and what sexual misconduct is based on Supreme Court precedents and went through this whole two and a half year process so that what we ended up with was uh, very predictable, fair and clear. But all that to say, um, the you know the politicization around this and what happened as a result of that dear colleague letter, the threats that uh, the Office for Civil Rights within the Department of Education um, lobbed against schools if they felt that they were you know if there if there was any indication that they didn't that they weren't falling in line with the dear colleague letter, they would open investigations that would involve you know myriads of people within a school and take years, and then they would then they would. Would uh, come down with uh, uh, you know agreements that be w that were private. Nobody could know about what that what the agreement said, in order to get the case closed for the Office for Civil Rights. And so all kinds of colleges and universities were signing on to these um, agreements because they didn't want to continue to have the debate. And so all of these things were cer certainly um, outside of the. Uh, the the issue of helping a child uh, or a student learn, and yet this was something that uh, the previous administration had waded way into. We corrected through our rulemaking process, and now we have to defend it against this administration. Did uh, in your? I'm sure you had interactions with um, people in the upper echelons of universities like this. Um, did they? My assumption would be that this is not something that they would want to be handling. I mean, it it's it, you sounds in your description there like this is the kind of thing that agencies like this are able to rope them into doing on their behalf, whether they want to or not. I would imagine, at least I I certainly hope, it's not the kind of thing that they really have a desire to be that deeply involved in. 
Well, I certainly don't think uh, college leadership generally does. But I also know from uh, firsthand experience how they will quietly come up to you and uh, applaud you for the direction you're taking and um, and the you know going through the actual rulemaking process and doing things properly. But they will not tell you you know they will not say that publicly because they don't want to get castigated by the you know the political left who has continued to stir these issues up unceasingly. Let's close our conversation with talking about uh, the future of education. Um, the obvious question that I could ask is, you know, well, what what's the biggest changes that we could make to uh, our education system to make it work better? Um, I think we we discussed that somewhat already, and changing the way that the systems uh, that we're funding students instead of systems. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of action on that right now. And anybody who follows Corey DeAngelis on Twitter from Reason, um, who is constantly documenting that there's legislation moving in all around the country in states to fund students instead of systems, um, opening up that kind of choice. Uh, so feel free to expand on any other uh, you know reforms uh, besides that really that major one uh, that you think are important. But I, I think to me the question I want to ask is. I was told by a lot of people, you know, coming into COVID, again, looking at the silver linings, right, that we're going to see so much innovation that is going to happen as a result of these kind of crisis circumstances. You know, it's the way Americans respond to circumstances like this, that we just were a little shocked at first, and then we just mobilize enormous resources behind finding ways to solve these problems. What innovations have been happening in the education space that our listeners might not be aware of, but have the potential in your mind to be really transformative for families, for students going forward? Well, I, uh, I talk about a lot of these. A lot of stories in my book are around uh, schools or learning environments that are doing things differently already today. Uh, but they're pockets. They're small. They're you know they 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 can and should be replicated far and wide. Um, I think one of the most exciting ones is the model of uh, small schools, small gatherings that are oriented around uh, student mastery, demonstrating when you've mastered a concept uh, and then the ability to move on, so that you know grade. Grade lines, bright lines are are really erased, and students are moving at their own pace through every subject uh, area and and the material based on their ability to uh, get you know get that that part done. And um, you know we've we have oriented all of K twelve education around we measure it by seat time, not by uh, not by mastery, and that would be a big switch. I think um, another area that will help hasten. Uh, the kind of uh, model change to funding students versus systems and buildings is a real uh, radical transparency around what is actually happening in the government-run traditional schools today, around every bit of curriculum, around every bit of uh, expenditure of taxpayer dollars that comes into that system. Because we know for a fact that uh, the cost of education has continued to rise exponentially over the years, and yet we're getting poorer results in terms of student achievement. So open up the books, open up everything, let parents in to see what's going on, let them, you know, welcome their questions, welcome their pushback, don't force them out because they raise their voices and raise questions at the school board meeting. Uh, these are areas where every parent has an opportunity to ensure their voice is heard on behalf of their child. And um, that coupled with the policy change that will actually fund their children versus funding the buildings and systems will ultimately result in the kind of creativity that we, we can com- we've come to expect of Americans. Yeah, there's something that you said in there that reminded me of um, – so I've, I've known a number of people who are teachers, and for years I would always – and, and you know, blanket statement here, and I, I, so much of the rhetoric around education is so disappointing. I don't know anybody who hates teachers. Um, I don't know anybody who thinks um, – tr- really significant people who think we should end public education. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, arguments to the fringe on this stuff, and it, it ignores a serious conversation that should actually go on. Uh, but I heard from a lot of those teachers from years who would bemoan this, like, parents are not involved enough in their kids' education. 
And it's the car dealer problem, right? If you buy a new car and it's fantastic, you may tell your friends, you may tell the people that you work with how great the car is, but you don't call the car dealer and tell them that. But if you get a lemon, then you're on the phone with the car dealer and you're angry. And unfortunately, I think education becomes a similar model in that aspect. You know, teachers do, I'm sure, get positive feedback. But they hear a lot from parents when parents are unhappy about something. I think that's just a mentality change. I don't know if this needs to change in the way teachers are prepared for their jobs. But it's, I think you're right that we, you know, we want that interaction with, with teachers. And I try to be mindful of that with my own kids' teachers you know, who are phenomenal. And to tell them that, like, you know, my, my daughter loves your classes. They're, you know, they're, she's having a great time. Um, but often the things you're focused on are problems. Um, and for both parents and teachers to understand the nature of uh, that interaction and be welcoming of it rather than, you know, both parents thinking the teacher doesn't care enough because the teacher is, you know, on the receiving end of a lot of unhappy parents. And, you know, that's just the way that some of these things are going to work. But the reality is, with a model of education freedom where the funds follow the child and the child and their family choose the education setting, the teacher, a great teacher, is the most valuable part of that equation. And it will fundamentally change the dynamic between teachers and parents today. Right now, the system gets in, in the way of that in many regards. And if you're a really great teacher, often your peers... Um, subtly or not so subtly, try to put you back in the in your box and not uh, not excel, not sort of stand up out of the crowd. There is not not a lot of incentive for great teachers to be even greater and to help incoming teachers become great teachers. The system itself is not serving teachers well. Um, it is really has deprofessionalized them in many ways. So in an education freedom model, the teachers will be free as well, and they will be highly valued. One final question, because there's one major thing that we haven't touched on yet. Uh, what do you make of the explosion we have seen in the last couple of years in homeschooling of people saying, I'm going to opt out of this system entirely. I'm going to educate my kids on my own. And what impact do you think that that has on both public and private education in this country? Well, I think it's I think it's a really important development and I hope that policies will continue to support the furtherance of that where families have grouped together and maybe in some cases have almost a little one room schoolhouse type situation and may have hired a great teacher to come in and teach their children that way let's empower those to continue and to thrive. Um, the explosion in uh, families that are doing homeschooling, you know, doubled for the the, the, the population writ large. Um, and this is just what's reported. So, yeah. uh, and then among black families, importantly, quintupled from 3% to 15%. Let's make sure that policies are supporting those choices if that's the right choice long term for the families that have chosen that. And if more want to choose that, we should be empowering that and we should be, uh, you know, celebrating those developments and uh, and supporting all of the families that are, are choosing that. Betsy DeVos, thank you so much for joining us today on Act in Line. Thanks for the opportunity, Eric. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Gabriel Zsa Zsa.